Easter was about a month ago. I know, already, Easter was about a month ago. And, uh, of course, at Easter, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. Okay. He comes back from the grave, he defeats death, and he never dies again. Okay. That, that's something. Right? That's hard for us to get our heads around. Um, and, and yet, our faith is so dependent upon that event. We've also been taking some time since then to look at just some of the uh, other instances in Scripture where God brought people back to life. Jesus wasn't the first person to come back from the dead. The difference is, Jesus was the first one to come back from the dead and never die again. Okay? Uh, but everyone, everyone else, at times, came back from the dead, but then, ultimately, they, they, of course, ended their lives, hopefully years, presumably years later. The first one that we, we came to was, uh, oops, we got Jesus. Oh, so here's where I want to go back. So the resurrection of Jesus, because what it, this is, well, the reason we're covering this is because it's not just about the events. I don't want you just to walk away with a list of saying, oh yeah, here are the people that came back to, to life. In our growth group celebration last week, we looked at, very briefly, a list of 10 different times or groups of people, individuals, that in Scripture were told they came back to life. Okay? And so we're not, you know, this series will not have accomplished its goal if you happen to have memorized those 10 and can pass the test on the way out today. Okay, um, I mean, that would be nice. You might get an extra piece of chocolate in the parking lot. But uh, the <laughs> one piece of chocolate per you know, uh, resuscitation that you, you can list. Um, but that's not the purpose of the of the lesson. <laughs> the purpose of, the, of this series is to say why. Why did God perform these, bring these people back to life? Why did he restore life to them? And, and perhaps in, in the back of our minds, there's also another question that says, why didn't he do it to other people? Right? Um, so, when we look at the, the resurrection of Jesus, the, the lesson, the, the application that we made on, on Easter was that it reveals God's faithfulness. Okay? That God finishes what he starts. That, that he said he was going to defeat, overcome the curse that was the result of sin. Of course, the central element of the curse was death. Right? Eat of the fruit of the tree and you'll surely die. And uh, that was where... Satan came to Eve and, and challenged her and said, No, did he really say you'll surely die? Yeah. Are you sure? And, um, and so that was the centerpiece of the consequence of sin. And, and God finishes what he starts because when God comes to earth, he doesn't just teach us a better way to live. He doesn't just say, live a life without sin. Right? That's how we'll overcome the curse. That's how we'll get back to the way things are. Just live without sin. Jesus could do it. Why can't you guys? Right? Instead, what he says is, I'm going to defeat death. I'm going to overcome the curse. Okay? And because that is defeated, now everybody can look forward to that new life. So God is faithful. He finishes what he starts. So then we looked at Elijah in the book of First Kings. And Elijah was a prophet during the reign of Ahab and his wife Jezebel, uh, King Ahab and Jezebel. And he goes up to the northern country of Tyre, uh, Sidon, modern Lebanon. A and we see throughout the ministry of, Ty of, of Elijah that he's in constant conflict with the gods, the local pagan gods of the region. 
And so when he brings, he does two things with the, the widow. He gives her food, which her local guard couldn't do. And then he restores life to her son again, which her local guard couldn't do. And so he demonstrates the, the truth, the power of Yahweh, of Israel's God, over Baal and all other deities that people worshipped. And so that was a really important part. Yeah, the widow probably didn't care about Baal and you know, whoever the other gods were. Right? She's just glad to have a son back, right? <laughs> but in terms of what's going on in the big picture, as we read and as we study, as we work our way through everything that God is doing, we see this showdown. Elijah has already had a showdown on top of the mountain with the, the prophets of Baal. And, uh, and now he takes it. He could, he could destroy the prophets of Baal, or God through Elijah could destroy the prophets of Baal. Now he, anybody can destroy. Destroying is easy, right? You and I can destroy things, right? We could go crazy and destroy this room this morning if we wanted, okay? Probably take us about 15 minutes and we could throw all the chairs out the windows, right? Yeah, we're not going to do that, okay? That's not the application. But, but we could do it. It would be easy. But if all the chairs were thrown out the windows before we got here this morning and we had to put it back together again, there's an art form to putting it back together, right? It's a lot more difficult to put it back together than it is to destroy it. And so God destroys the prophets of Baal on top of the mountain. It's a, a stunning victory. But now God also can do the reverse and bring someone back from death. And that is um, a decisive victory over those pagan gods. Next, we, we jump forward a lot of years. We come to Jesus and we, we looked at Jesus as he uh, raises, I made a mistake there. Uh, the widow's son was what we did in, um, no, that's right, widow's son. We did one in the growth group celebration as well, so I'm getting mixed up. But he raises the widow's son. Remember the... He, he sees a funeral taking place. And, and he just walks over to the funeral. And, and he can identify that the, the woman is a widow. He, he learns or knows that this is her only son. And he's, we're told he's just moved with compassion. And so while we so often focus on the power of God... And while we might think of a, a resurrection of bringing someone back from the dead as the ultimate demonstration of the power of God, in this instance, it's a demonstration of the compassion of God. And I think that's important for us to, to keep in mind because I think our relationship with God, we can view it through a lot of different lenses. We can view it, you know, we can think of God as the person that our sins have offended. We can think of God as the Father whose Son we're responsible for putting on the cross and we can be filled with guilt and shame. We can think of God as the one who sent the fire onto the prophets on top of um, the mountain and destroyed them. The God who can calm the winds and the waves and, and we go, that's, you know, a God to keep a distance from. Don't get too close to that God. You might get burnt. Okay. We can think of a, a God that, that has like a, a father with unrealistic expectations. Right. Or we can think of a God that has compassion towards his children. And so as we approach God, whether in prayer, perhaps around the Lord's table, just in our lives, we, we have these different views of him and it, and it impacts how we think about him, how we think about ourselves. But as Jesus raises the widow's son, he's moved with compassion. That's his motivation. And I suggested last week that moved with compassion is best understood as moved toward her with compassion. I understand move with compassion. It's like a, a phrase of speech that means, you know, it's compassion overtakes his 
emotions, his senses. But there's a very real sense in which compassion prompts us to move towards those that we feel compassion towards. That we can't just remain at a distance. And so when we say that God is compassionate to us, we're saying that God moves towards us. And certainly Jesus coming to earth exemplifies that move. And so we finally get to today's resurrection or resuscitation. And that is that Jesus raises Lazarus. And this happens in, we find this in John chapter 11. And it happens uh, shortly before his own death. We just read the story, so I don't need to, to tell it to you again. Um, well, we read some of it. It's a, a long passage. If you're in a growth group, we'll, we'll read all of it this week. Um, but there's a lot of questions, I think, around this event. The first question is that Jesus is at a distance when Lazarus gets sick. And he doesn't rush back. We go, why doesn't he rush back? What's going on? Where's the moved with compassion at this time? Okay. And, uh, and so that's sort of one to wrestle with. And, and perhaps we don't have an answer there that makes us feel really good about the situation. And so then we, we come back. Uh, he comes back to Bethany, the town of Bethany. And uh, he talks with Lazarus's sisters, Mary and Martha. And they have the question that I think all of us have at this point in the story, and that is, why didn't you hurry back? You could have saved him. You could have rescued him. And uh, again, Jesus doesn't really give an answer that satisfies them. But if, if we think about what it is, why do they want Jesus to come back? It's to heal him so they can have their brother restored to them in good health. Now, Jesus is going to accomplish that. Their brother is going to be restored to them in good health. It's just not quite in the way that they expect or in the time frame that they expect. But I want us to not so much go over the, the facts of this story, but I want us to look at the whys. Why did Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead? You might remember uh, when Jesus goes into the wilderness at the beginning of his ministry, he's tempted by Satan. And uh, the first temptation after he's been fasting for 40 days is to turn rocks into bread. Okay. Um, I kind of picture this bread as not being like, uh, you know, the, the flat bread you know, that you might roll up and you know, put some food in and roll up, but more like a cinnamon roll. Yeah. That was the temptation. You haven't eaten for 40 days. You know, Jesus, you could turn these into bread, but not just any bread, right? You could turn this into the best bread ever made. And how tempting must that have been for Jesus? You see, the temptation here, we can, we can say, what's wrong with doing that? The temptation is that he uses his powers, his, his divine powers, for his purposes, to make his life more comfortable, to make his experience on earth a little less human, right? To, to eat away at his humanity, to allow his divinity to override it and, and say, yeah, I, you know, I, I lived with amongst all those people, but, you know, I just had a steak whenever I wanted on the side. They thought I was praying up on that mountaintop, but no, you know, I was eating steak that I just made out of thin air. And, and so... Jesus didn't make his own life easier. He didn't use his powers for his own benefit, but for the benefit of others. So when we, we look at Lazarus, why would you raise Lazarus from dead? He's your friend. Are you like breaking this rule? Are you doing something just because you want to do it? Jesus is very clear throughout um, this, this passage about the reasons that he raises Lazarus to life. In verse 4, 
this is, is they hear that Lazarus is, is sick. In verse 4, when he heard this, Jesus said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Okay. <laughs> and you go, well, hang on, doesn't he die? It's like, yes, he does, but it doesn't end in death. That, that's not the end of the story. But he says that this is happening so that for the glory of God and so that God's Son may be glorified. And so what we see then is that Jesus is approaching Jerusalem and he's approaching the end of his life. And he's convincing people still of who he is. Right? And so this becomes one of those significant moments to say, hey, this is the power that God has. Right? And through the Son, through himself, this is what God can do. And so this is a demonstration of who God is. And then we come down and we see again in verse 14, a slightly different reason. They've arrived. Sorry, um, it, it, they get the message that he has died. And so he, he says to his disciples in verse 14, he says, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there. That's strange, right? That is strange. So that you may believe. Now let us go to him. You see? So yes, it's for God's glory. Yes, it's for Jesus' glory. A demonstration of who he is, his relationship with God and the power that God has. But it's also that that demonstration is not just, yay, look at me. It's for them, his disciples, for others to believe who he is. To build their faith, which is his ultimate, well, there's several ultimate purposes, but one of his purposes of being on earth, right, is that to, to have people believe in him, in who he is and what he can do. I want to then jump down. So that's the first one there. Glorifies God, and we can talk about the believing. I'll come back to that. But in verse 24, I want to spend a little extra time on this one. Let's start reading verse 21. Lord, Martha, Lazarus' sister, said to Jesus, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live and though they die, uh, even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And so, I think something very important happens here for Martha. And it, it's something that I believe that we can relate to. Jesus challenges her to move from the abstract or the generic to the specific. Okay. And, and I think it's because what he, he says to her, he says, hey, Lazarus is going to come back to dead, from the dead. And she says, I'm a Pharisee. I believe in the afterlife. Okay? That's my, they're my people. That's my background. I believe in the resurrection. And so, yes, I, you are right, Jesus. I know that Lazarus will come to life at the resurrection at the end. And, and I look forward to that. I have hope for that. Okay, that's a good thing. 
But then Jesus actually says, well, that's true. But I am the resurrection and the life. And what are the implications of that? One of the implications is that at any point in time, Jesus can give life to people. And so he's taking her from there is a resurrection at the end of time, which is for everyone, or at least for all of God's people. And he brings her back and says, how is that relevant to this situation? I want you to move from the resurrection of thousands or millions of people to me being the resurrection and the life. And what does that mean for you, Martha? Martha thinks about it for a little bit and then she makes this great confession. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. You see, her faith is no longer, no longer just in, hey, everybody's going to be resurrected. Her faith is, Jesus, you can resurrect me. You can resurrect Lazarus. You offer something special. Gone from the abstract to the particular I think that we, it's easier for us to live in the abstract. It's easier for us to live in the general. John 3.16 says that God loves the world, right? God loves the world. Well, that's great. And we can say that all that we want. But when life gets difficult... When things aren't going the way we expected them to go, do we sometimes have the question, does God love me? Because we can believe that God loves the world and at the same time believe that God doesn't love me at the moment. Because of what I'm going through, because of what I'm experiencing. And so we have to move from the general and say, oh yeah, God is love. God loves the world. We have to to bring it down and say, does God love me? And how can I know that? How can I know that? Psalm 139 begins like this. You have searched me, Lord. And you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my laying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. God knows us better than we know ourselves. That's what that last verse means. That that this knowledge is too much for me. I don't know what I'm going to say before I say it sometimes, right? I I don't know where I'm going or where I'm coming from. right? I'm just here i can't be hemmed in in front and behind but god can hem me in in front and behind he can surround me and 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 i can't do it he knows me better than i know myself and 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 the author of the psalm knew that and it's something that we have to to, to sort of incorporate into our lives and say yes i when when life is tough when i'm wondering if god loves me when i can say oh yeah god loves people but i don't know if he loves me that this is something that all of God's people should be able to say. God knows us all this well. Ephesians 
chapter 2 and verse 4 has this to say. Because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. Okay? Now, because of his great love for us, now here this is bringing it back. Not, so, not that just that God so loved the world or that God is love, but that His love for us. And He's writing to a church. Okay? So He's specifically saying, yes, it's love for the church, but it's love for the people in the church. Now I know that many times I think we, we, we have the opposite problem. We say that all of the Scripture is about me individually <laughs> and we need to be a little less self-centric but there are times where we need to be very personal about the care the concern the love that God has for us and so when he says God loves the world there are no exceptions to that that Christ died for all let me give another example though that's a reassuring example that goes from the general to the specific, and we have to make that move. But the other one we, we make is sometimes it's very comfortable for us to be broad, to be general, and say, oh yeah, we're all sinners. Everyone sins, right? I'm a sinner. You're a sinner. We're all sinners. And we're correct, aren't we? We all need Jesus. We all need forgiveness. Christ died for all of us. Okay? And, and so there's a truth to that. But when we leave it at that level, we take away personal responsibility, don't we? We, we take away and saying, well, that, that, because we're all sinners, then just because I did something wrong, I'm not worse than anyone else. Right? Uh, you know, uh, I'm nothing special just because I did that. Just because I hurt that person in that way. Just because I was dishonest about this. Everybody does that. And so we have to make this move from the generic that everybody sends to, to recognizing that there are things that I have done against God. Right? You see, I was God's enemy. Right? It wasn't just, oh yes, all of humanity was God's enemy because all of humanity sins. I need to take some personal responsibility for this and say, yes, I was an enemy of God because I was living my life in defiance of Him, in defiance of the way, the, the character, the person of who He is. And so we can look at passages like Galatians 5. We spent a good bit, deal of time recently in the fruit of the Spirit. Um, and, and that's a nice, reassuring a sort of passage to spend our time in. But there's a need for us to also spend some time in the verses beforehand. The flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit. And the Spirit, what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other. So that you are not to do whatever you want, but if you are led by the Spirit, you're not under law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I know a minister at church, he, before he baptizes someone, he, he sits down with them and says, okay, here's sort of like a list. He looks at, I don't know if it's this specific passage, but a passage like it. And he says, I want you to write down which ones of these are you washing away today. Because you're not just washing away your sinfulness, you're washing away your sins 
when you're baptized. You're washing away the things that you have done wrong. The guilt that attaches to them. You're not washing away your humanity. You're not washing away your existence in a fallen world. You're washing away the things that you have done. Now, what are those things? What are the things that you've been forgiven for? And, and it's uncomfortable, isn't it? Because we've spent so much effort and time trying to forget those things. Yes. If I don't talk about it, maybe it didn't happen. If they don't mention it to me, maybe I didn't hurt them or offend them the way that I think maybe I did. If we can just keep silent. But I believe God wants us to say, I've been cleansed of the things that I've done wrong. And those things are. I'm not saying we need to stand up here and read our list to everybody. But it would be good to have a list. It would be good to have a list and pull it out and every so often say to God, God, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Such as these. right? Because it's easy to live in the general. But Jesus didn't just die for sinfulness. He died for the things that had been done against God. We can look in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 and 11. Another list of things there. And Paul is able to write here, he says, this is who you used to be. Right? And he's not saying that they're now sinless. He's just saying this is the lifestyle you were caught up in. And now, even though you continue to sin, you are living a new lifestyle and your sins are forgiven because you are children of God. And so Martha makes this move when Jesus comes and he's, he says, this is, I, Martha, you need to, to focus on who I am and what I'm doing. Well, I'm not just here for the resurrection at the end of time that you already believe in for the children of God. He says, I have something different to offer you. Do you believe me? And Martha says, yes, I do. Oops, too far. That was my longest point there. He challenges Martha to move from the abstract to the specific. We see in John 11, in verses 41 and 42, he, he gives another reason for raising Lazarus. Jesus, before he brings Lazarus out of the tomb, he says, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. <laughs> then he kind of says, now, you always hear me, God, I, you know, I know that, but I want everybody else to understand that you've heard me too. Okay, so that sort of should be in parentheses, you know, comment by the way. And then he says, I say it for the benefit of these people standing here that they might believe that you sent me. Okay? You see, it wasn't just believe in him, although that was certainly a big part of it, but believe that he was sent by God. That he was fulfilling God's purpose. And so when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man, it's interesting, they still call him the dead man, came out. His hands and his feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, take off the grave clothes and let him go. Jesus was sent from God. Not everybody believed that though. We're told in verse 45, therefore many of the Jews who'd come to visit Mary and seen what Jesus did, believed in him. And you go, yes, mission accomplished, Right? This is what he's been talking about. I want you to believe. I want you to believe in me. I want you to believe that God sent me. And he says, many of them did. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. And rather than the chief priests and the Pharisees celebrating a restoration of life, 
they called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. An emergency session. What are we accomplishing? They asked. Here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him. And then the Romans will come and take away our temple and our nation. And uh, we can keep going there. Um, but it was at this point that they decided that they were going to kill him. Enough is enough. Um, yeah, in verse 50, Caiaphas says, You do not realize it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish. And in 53, so from that day on, they plotted to take his life. If Jesus keeps going around raising people from the dead, everyone's going to follow him. Right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> take notes of that. And they say the problem with that, the problem with that is that the Romans won't like it. And the Romans will come in and the Romans will destroy the temple. They'll destroy the city. They'll destroy all of us. And so what they're saying is that we don't fear this person who can bring back, restore life to the dead. Rather, we fear the Romans more than we fear that person. And we say, well, what are you thinking? What are you thinking? The Romans can't bring anyone back from the dead. Like, can you imagine that battle that takes place, right, as the Romans come on Jerusalem and somebody dies and Jesus says, don't worry, I got him. Right? And he pops back up again. And, and, and yet they're more concerned about what the Romans can do than the power, than the source, than the significance of a person coming back from the dead. And then we think about our lives, don't we? <laughs> Are there things that we fear more than, than or, or we sort of view as having more power than we do our prayers to the one who raises the dead? And so Jesus is convincing people that he's from God. Some believe it and some still don't. And then finally... He foreshadows his own death and resurrection. You see, Jesus brings life to a dead man. And that same moment gets the ball rolling on the death of a living man. Right? It, because Jesus is going to, he, he restores life to Lazarus and just a few days, a week later, or so later, he's um, going to have his own life taken. But just as Lazarus emerges from the tomb, Jesus is also going to emerge from the tomb. Lazarus comes out wrapped in, in the cloths and a separate cloth for his head, and we're told that when the disciples go to the tomb to look for him, they see the grave clothes laid out and the napkin around his head laying on the stone there also. You see, Jesus defeated death in the life of Lazarus. And, and I, I wonder if this wasn't there, like if you think, where's the compassion? Is, the level of compassion that takes place, Jesus knows he's going to die. He knows what's ahead of him. He says, before I go, before I go, I want to remind you of this. God can give life to the dead. <laughs> Not just in the resurrection at the end of time. God can give life to the dead in the here and in the now. And, and, and so he's sort of leading his disciples. and He's saying, do you believe? Do you believe in who I am? And when life doesn't go as they expect, when Jesus is crucified, I wonder if any of them thought, Lazarus came to life. God could do it for him. Can he do it for Jesus? Lazarus was there four days in the tomb. We've still got time for God to do something for Jesus. 
And so I think it's a, a foreshadowing here of what is going to happen, a, a, an opportunity to give hope and comfort to his disciples. The death is only temporary. Death is a falling asleep, as Jesus calls it. And I understand the grief that comes, right? We've all been there. We've experienced that grief. And, and it's interesting that even here, that Mary, Martha, the disciples, they all experienced that grief. Right? You see, if Jesus had gone when he was sick, he would have removed that grief from them. They could have avoided that sadness. They could have uh, uh, avoided the, you know, the, the torment of, of carrying their brother and putting him in the tomb, of, of dressing his body, of laying him there, and of walking away, of going home to an empty house. They could have avoided all of that, but Jesus instead comes to them when they're at their, their lowest moment, when they're, they're wondering, you know, thinking it's the end of the story, thinking that their story has been written, that his story is ended, is concluded, and Jesus comes and he says, in this time of darkness, in this time of sadness, in this time of hurt and of question, he says, Lazarus, come out. Lazarus, come out. Okay? And, and Lazarus does. Because we can all stand at a cemetery. We can all stand in front of a tomb. And we can say, come back. I want you back. I want to hold you in my arms. I want you. I miss you. Can you just come back? But only when Jesus says it, does the person come back. And so Jesus finds us at our lowest points. And then he provides the comfort. Then he shares his compassion and his power. And, and for me, as I look at this, I'm just, it sort of brings everything together and it says, Jesus' power. Yes, it can be power can be terrifying, can't it? We get, we get terrified when the wrong people have power. They have too much power. Okay? We go, oh, this is not good. But when power is used for compassion, it changes lives, doesn't it? When we use the power that we have, the influence that we have, the abilities and the resources that we have to change lives, to show compassion to people, rather than just to demonstrate our superiority, we bring light into darkness. We transform lives. And as we transform lives, God, through us, transforms the world. And that's what Jesus did. Yes, Lazarus, he's going to die again. But he's a foreshadow of Jesus who is not going to lie again, die again. Who will return. Who gives us hope of the same resurrection that he experienced. Thank you.